anyone's facing a little audio issues when you're uh, on your browser, please refresh your browser. Uh, so you get back to your audio and video so that it doesn't disturb the presenter to, uh, during the uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, you could give start with the. Yeah, we're, we're live now. Yeah, great. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, uh, everybody who's on, on the webinar, off the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, with me, we've got Kathy Lemon. Uh, she's an amazing woman. Uh, she has started a movement uh, all by herself, uh, which has become a very big international movement on homeoprophylaxis. Um, she did her homeopathy from the College of uh, Practical Homeopathy and uh, then from the School of Homeopathy in the UK. Uh, she's also done a specialized homeopathic study with the Gesundes Bewustein in Germany and the Amma Resonance Healing Foundation in the Netherlands. Uh, she started this, uh, the Homeoprophylaxis. Uh, it's a non-profit organization uh, which works on increasing the awareness of homeopathy in terms in in the times of epidemics and the pandemics, like what we're facing now. Uh, she's learned a lot from. Dr. Isaac Golden, and she's also working towards putting up a small course for homeopathic doctors uh, who can learn more about this. Uh, earlier, I was I was talking to Kathy on how she got into this, and Kathy, if you don't mind, can you share uh, uh, why, how how you got into this uh, homeoprophylaxis? What what made you start this movement, if I may call it that? Sure, sure. Well, I have I have three children. My my baby is just about 22 years old, so I've been a mother of, for quite a while. But our second son, who is 24, was diagnosed with autism shortly before his third birthday, and at that time, I was certain I was doing everything correct for my children. I was just following everything I was told. I was doing everything right. So that was at a time all those years ago that talk was beginning to happen be, uh, as far as a possible connection between vaccines and autism. And my, my gut reaction was absolutely not that can't be so because I'm doing everything right for my children. Don't tell me I did something that, that wrong. And so, uh, but I kept hearing it. And so because I wanted to be doing things right for my children, I thought, well, cause, because I'm still hearing this, let me look into it because the thought struck me. <laughs> If immunization is that important, surely vaccines are not the only choice. So my husband, who's a computer expert, he works for Microsoft, I, I had him help me put together, it was pre-Google days, he helped me put together a um, search on two terms, immunization and alternatives. And that's when I first stumbled across Dr. Isaac Golden in Australia and what he was doing, the remarkable work he was doing. He's been researching homeoprophylaxis since 1986. He's actually, his PhD is actually in homeoprophylaxis. And I remember so clearly looking at what he was finding with homeoprophylaxis. It also coincided with the beginning of my own homeopathic studies. And the amazing results he was documenting, finding how effective homeoprophylaxis was. I just remember so clearly thinking, wishing that I could be out on the roofs just dancing, just saying, look, look, here it is. Here is your option. You can do this, and it works. And so one thing led to another, and finally, uh, it was 2013 that I finally was able to connect directly with Isaac Golden. Um, he helped me with my son. My son's doing remarkably well today. Uh, he's doing better in some of his university classes than I ever did. Wow. But, um, yeah, and so it was 2015 that got me going with this, and I'll talk more about that too. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess was that my cue to get going? <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. I just want to know how how something you know. I thought there was a lot more coming. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, there, there is. I just didn't know. Is, yeah, I just yeah, didn't yeah. know how much to okay, say at that okay. point. <laughs> All right. So, so that that's good. I mean, he is. Um, I think uh, the single uh, who who's done most research on on this subject, who 
whom your profile access. There is a line in in which Hanuman has written that uh, it was used as a home profile access. Mm -hmm. So, which is good. And uh, so, we have you here for today. And let me not take more time. And uh, we'll ask you to dive right into your presentation. Okay, since we're already mm -hmm. late. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate so much you asking me to, to share uh, what what I'm very very passionate about homeo prophylaxis. Uh, what happened? I'll just uh, share this picture here. This is a uh, the logo for my organization, Homeo Prophylaxis, a worldwide choice for disease prevention. Because I was able to connect with Isaac Golden in 2013, it was 2015 that I actually um, I and a colleague were able to put together the first uh, international. Uh, conference for homeoprophylaxis, a worldwide choice. Isaac Golden was our keynote speaker for this. We also had uh, brought in speakers from around uh, around the world for this. It was very well attended. It took took place here in Dallas, Texas, where I where my practice is headquartered. I all right. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm on a small farm outside of uh, Dallas, Texas, but this is where my, my business and where homeoprophylaxis is a world choice is headquartered. So our first conference took place here in 2015. It was very well attended, very, very well received. And I just, I, I knew even before that conference ended that we needed to do more. And so it followed in 2017, we, uh, I, I got to get, put together another one that took place in the Netherlands. And then so interestingly, in um, January, January of this year, January 2020, um, the third one took place in De New Delhi, India. New Delhi. I was able to work with, yes, yes, I was able to work with some wonderful people, including Dr. Uh, Raj Manchanda, Dr. Anil Karana. I was able to, it was my first time visiting India. And what a wonderful, what a beautiful country you have in India. And I look forward to being able to get back. I was very, very inspired by so much that I saw over there. But what I want to um, share with you in this uh, presentation today is the tremendous history there is with homeoprophylaxis in homeopathy. Uh, as Kartik was, was referring to earlier, Hahnemann himself uh, found, found out about the prophylactic use of homeopathic medicines. But beyond that, Homeopathy, you may have heard this, at least heard this by now, homeopathy has a tremendous, tremendous historical record in how well it works with, with epidemics and pandemics. And I think you'll see as we, as we proceed with this that there really is a connection between these two. And, well, let's just, let's just get going with this. So, yeah. uh, because this is very much on our mind today, the, the coronavirus, COVID-19, um, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time talking specifically about this, but I wanted to be sure that I took this page to share with you several resources that, that I will encourage you to visit uh, and so that you can gain more information yourself about uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Uh, Robin Murphy, Dr. Robin Murphy, a very well-known homeopath, has a four-part free video uh, series from the Center for Homeopathic Education right in, in London itself to Andre Sain, has a wonderful presentation right at um, the American Institute of Homeopathy's uh, website right there. And Dr. Jeremy Schur uh, has a wonderful uh, multi-part broadcast. There's, there's a website for that. There's even more than this. Um, the I, I'm I'm Fran's colleagues with with the uh, editor in chief of the American Journal of Homeopathic Medicine, they uh, have just released their summer issue, which has a special focus there on on COVID nineteen. So it's it's got some remarkable, um, many remarkable articles in that too. As well, here's a couple of art, uh, articles right from hpathy.com, One by Isaac Golden himself. One by the well-known Rajan Sankaran as well. So please take those. Uh, as places where you can learn directly about it. So, uh, and this is where I like to start everything that I present, knowing history. I, I love history. I, I lived in Germany for a while. There's so much we can learn from history so that we can improve where we are today and therewith humanity will be improved. This is why we need to know history. This is why it is so effective for us to know how we have, why we have, what we have today. 
hardly anything is actually proven. Almost everything is simply assumptions. The biggest error in every field of science is the fact that so-called knowledge is nothing more than a current theory. When you think about this, I remember so well when, when we returned from India late January, that was when everything was beginning to hit the fan. I wanted to know about the COVID, uh, the coronavirus, excuse me, the coronavirus. And so I went to a uh, well-known allopathic website that I do frequent because I, I, the best teacher is the best learner. And I, and I, and I will be the first to tell everybody, but anybody that I don't know everything. <laughs> so I go to this sites like this and I wanted to know more about the coronavirus. And so I went to um, web MD and there, there I've, I, I learned the coronavirus is mankind has known about since about 1937 when it was first isolated and it was it's been known since about 1960 to actually inflict affect humans and generally speaking what the coronavirus will provide is a minor disease it's a, it's responsible for between 20 and 30% of the common cold and so uh but but what was interesting to beyond this is that i went back to webmd after everything started displaying itself and wouldn't you know it, all over WebMD was COVID-19, COVID-19, COVID-19. I had to dig to find what I originally found just at the end of January. This is why, another reason why it's so good to know and appreciate history, because what we are looking at today, 50 years, 100 years down the road, they may be laughing at today that we, we looked at this as science <laughs> it changes so and this is one of the beauties of it as well too because homeopathic principles have not changed in more than 200 years some things do remain the same so this is where i like to proceed uh with and this is one of the issues that we had today this is um a video that does not play so there's no audio for this video what this is it's a, it's an interview of uh dr manchanda uh, that took place uh, at the conference in New Delhi. And in this video, Dr. Manchanda shares, and unfortunately the audio does not uh, display, Dr. Manchanda shares that the reason, and I firmly believe this too, the reason that we know homeopathy today is because of its effectiveness in prophylactic use. And I will insert there as well as in uh, its use in epidemics and pandemics. So there, there we go. Dr. Manchanda says it too. Oops. So here we go. And, and it's even more and more in the news today. And this is another reason why I'm so impressed with what I'm seeing in India. This is an article that I just, uh, it was just Monday that I learned of this article that came out on the 23rd. So that would have just been this last Sunday uh, in the state of Gujarat in Western India. 34 million people have been treated with arsenic amalgam. Okay, and of those quarantined within that state, 99.6% have tested negative for the COVID-19. I have a website, um, excuse me, a Facebook page for homeoprophylaxis, a worldwide choice. Um, and, I, and I posted this on, the, on the, uh, the Facebook page for HPWWC, my organization. Facebook pulled that, pulled this article. They've got their reasons, they've got their reasons, but here this article is, this is what we need to know. This is what we need to be excited about with homeopathy because this is, homeopathy works. Let's look, I, I like to share this, a brief run through of relevant homeopathic history with a US focus, because that's where, that's where I live. And there's really a, a tremendous history of homeopathy within here in the United States. Uh, it was brought to the United States in the early 1820s, and it was very big uh, in the U.S. until the early 1900s. We had homeopathic hospitals. We had homeopathic universities, more than a thousand homeopathic pharmacies. This was in the infancy of the United States. Um, the American Institute of Homeopathy, AIH, it, was, it is the oldest medical organization in our country. It was established even before the American Medical Association. They actually, te technically, truth be told, the AMA, American Medical Association, was established in retaliation 
to the um, American Institute of Homeopathy because they were threatened by it. But homeopathy was working so well and so good here in this country. We have still the Homeopathic Pharmacopeia of the United States, the HPUS. It has been in continuous publication since 1897. I've actually spoken with the chief scientist uh, of the HPUS. His name is uh, Eric Foxman. They are very, very serious about what they do here. Uh, it was a homeopath who actually helped establish the US FDA. And here's something that I found very interesting to learn. One of the gentlemen that I work with, he's a wonderful attorney by the name of Jim Turner. His practice is right in, of all places, Washington, DC. He's a wonderful, very powerful man. His primary care provider since 1970 has been a homeopath. So he has a deep love of homeopathy. He's also been to India several times. Um, I arranged a meeting between uh, Jim Turner and Dr. Manchanda. And it was there that I learned that the current Indian medical program was actually patterned directly after the FDA following the original 1938 FDCA. It used to be called the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. It's, that was very, very interesting to learn. It was said many times during the New Delhi conference that uh, India is now setting the standard for the world as far as homeopathy. I've seen enough uh, now that I believe this. I believe this. I remember very clearly touring uh, homeopathic facilities um, and just seeing all the research that's happening there. It's very impressive what's happening in, in the country of India. So let's look at a few definitions. Uh, and what I like to do is I like to look at all sides. I think that's the, that's the key to our research. You can't know of something for sure if you only re research one side of it. You've got to know every side. So let's look at the d definition of disease. Here, uh, Webster's Medical Dictionary from 2009 de uh, defines disease as a sickness or ailment caused by germs or viruses with consistent results. That makes sense. Then I looked at this. This was uh, by Jay Yasgur. If you don't have Yasgur's homeopathic dictionary, I would very much encourage you to get this because it's a tremendous book. I use it all the time. It, he defines it as a derangement of the vital force, quoting Hahnemann. Dis-ease, an, an illness or sickness, a disturbance in structure or function of an organ, organ system, or part of the body. And it goes on from there. It's a, we... we Within homeopathy, homeopathy, we look at disease as really what it really is. It's an all-encompassing thing. So let's look at this term epidemic, which is appropriate for today. Webster's Dictionary, a rapidly spreading disease that affects many people at one time in the same area. I like things simple. But let's look at what Dorothy Shepard in her wonderful book, Homeopathy and Epidemic Diseases, how she defines this. She says it's widespread excuse me widespread outbreaks of a disease affecting simultaneously a number of people in one or several neighborhoods and even whole districts states or countries a little bit expanding there and then this word here pandemic i just like this definition that that actually webster's dictionary has very simple pandemic is a widely spread epidemic don't get confused with what they all try and present to us today. No, that's what a pandemic is. I like things short and sweet. Beyond that, this is where history really, I feel, gets very, very interesting. If you're not familiar with this work, Divided Legacy by Harris Coulter, that's another book I will encourage you to uh, get out and read. There's some good reviews that you can find of it online today, too. We have two schools that have gone back and forth throughout history, throughout, this goes back to ancient Greece, you know, two schools of thought, probably even earlier than that. Uh, but with a focus on medicine, let's look at this. The empirical or vitalist school looks at the body as an energetic essence, calling, saying that we have within us a vital force, uh, a chi, the life force of prana. The rational or materialist school says the body is a material a mechanical and is a mechanical entity i can talk that's what it looks like it's all these different parts these different machines within it that, that need to be looked at independently uh what we work to do in, within the empirical school we we work to honor this homeostasis this equal balance 
But within the rational school, external forces majorly impact the physical being. <laughs> I'm not faulting one over the other. I'm just saying these are the predominant thoughts that are happening. There's a lot of good that is happening today with our rational materialist uh, approach, but there's a lot of good that we need to also embrace with from within the empirical school. Okay, how we look at knowledge. Knowledge through the empirical approach is found through practice, through historical context. Whereas knowledge in the rational school is, is done through experiment on dead organisms or living organisms in a laboratory or an unnatural setting. Okay, we study people in the empirical school in their daily life. It's a doctrine of cure by natural law. But the, the rational school likes to say we need to, that there, there's a physiological study of how sick and healthy organisms function. Knowledge in the empirical school of, of internal processes is not possible, not required for a cure. Look at Hahnemann and how much he didn't know as far as microbiology and, and all the submolecular things that we study so closely today, what great advances we've made today, but how much progress did Hahnemann make not knowing how to define all these things that he was looking at? So clearly he speaks so often about magnets. There's, there's no, no visible way to explain how a magnet works, but you know what, it's working. So that's what Hahnemann is saying here too with this. But uh, in the rational school, knowledge of internal processes is required for treatment. You can see the different balances. And remember, uh, to, as we go to the next, let's so, well, before we do that, uh, I'm stumbling all over myself. The Imperial Vital School likes to discover, prefers to discover through clinical practice. And again, with rational school, it's done in the labs. Another unnatural setting. So let's look at this. Remember the two different schools as we go to this, because I didn't get it put on the top here, the, the, the empirical school and the rational uh, school of thought on the, on the right. The definition of disease appropriate for today, disease being a derangement or imbalance of the vital energy of the person. But in the rational school, signs and symptoms are what are considered statistically abnormal. Let's look at symptoms. Uh, in the empirical school, it's holistic view. Physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual uh, symptoms are observed. In the rational school, usually in physiochemical terminology, if, if, the, if there is a psychological problem, it is often understood as separate and vice versa. One of the most fascinating studies that I uh, was able to do was into psychosomatic homeopathy. It's very, very interesting, as we would know within homeopathy, how the psych, psyche can, uh, can and does affect the physical being. Symptoms are the organism's effort to heal a person. They're the body's call for help. But symptoms in, in the rational school are the indications that something's wrong. We've got to fix it. We've got a headache. Well, take, take this painkiller. You know, there's a reason why it's there. So cause of disease, proximate causes. In the, in the empirical school, causes close to the result are not causes. They are other effects. Proximate causes are not important in therapies that seek to raise resistance. Whereas in the, in the rational school, they seek proximate causes of disease like internal, material, chemical, mechanical, or bacteriological causes. There's got to be a reason that this has happened. The specific internal cause in the empirical school it's always unknown, but causes in the rational school can be known. Environmental influences, again, in the empirical school can be stressors, but internal predisposition is understood to make the person susceptible to the disease in the first place. Read in there the word miasm. Okay, internal predisposition right there. But in the rational school, often external agents such as a virus, bacteria, or environment are seen as the cause of disease. It's the coronavirus today. We can say it's, it's, it's the coronavirus. It's, well, no, it's a susceptibility, the coronavirus. Again, I do not fault 
the rational school. We have done remarkable things today because of the focus. I mean, look at what we're doing as far as saving the 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 the, the premature babies born at 20, 24, 26 weeks, they can be saved. We look at remarkable things that are done with the heart, with the brain. Very valuable things have been done. I simply present uh, as as we should all view and grasp the value of knowing and appreciating what the empirical school has always offered. Okay, in the organon, I, I love the organon. Okay, his works, um, the foundation of homeopathy in aphorism six. What else do we want to cure in disease but the symptoms? Why is the body producing the symptoms? We don't need to see it, but ascertain through the symptom presentation that which we need to cure. We need to collect the totality of the symptoms. He speaks of that again and again. Aphorism 8, he presents that disease is a state of being of the, organiz or of the organism dynamically untuned by a disturbed vital force. I love that term, dynamically untuned. What we also have within the sixth edition, aphorism uh, 100, every epidemic presents a new disease. We need to look at it as this. Hame, uh, Hahnemann said this very clearly. We must know the unique symptoms for each epidemic to ascertain the proper homeopathic approach, except those caused, and he points this out, by some unvarying infections, including measles, smallpox, and today the chicken pox, things like that, that produce the same symptoms every time that they're there. Uh, but that's not always the case. Aphorism 240 expounds further on this. He's saying we must seek to find an epidemic's own consistent nature common to the individuals infected. We'll get more into that too as we look at uh, aphorisms 101, 102. That's where he talks more about this. And we call this today uh, the genus epidemicus. And more he speaks about that in aphorism 241, uh, finding here's a group of people and they're all having these common symptoms. Well, this is something interesting. You'll find this in what I referenced earlier, the um, 20, the summer 2020 American Journal of Homeopathic Medicine um, edition, uh, a, a, a doctor, Dr. Uh, Joel Shepard, he has a wonderful article uh, where he talks about and points out the fact this term genus epidemicus was not coined by Hahnemann. It was actually coined by uh, J.D. Rademacher, who was a contemporary of Hahnemann, but he never accepted homeopathic axioms. He points out, too, that we need to be very, very cautious about this genus epidemicus that is so widely spoken of. He's, he, uh, Dr. Shepard points out we need to not look at this as some sort of a silver bullet, magic answer to everything. It doesn't wipe out being able to clearly ascertain all the symptoms, everything about an epidemic. So the totality of the symptoms, this is how homeopathy, how homeopaths still work in their research. Careful, meticulous assessments. This has been done since Hahnemann's time. This is why homeopathic researchers are to this day, more than two centuries later, so carefully, fully, attentively researching people and situations in epidemics and pandemics. I work very closely with uh, Isaac Golden. He's spoken at every one of the conferences uh, that I've presented. He is world-renowned in how meticulous his research is, his, in his collection of, of research. He's helping me put together a, um, a, a, a very all-encompassing, we're hoping to make it a research project for homeoprophylaxis for here in the United States. We have so many things within homeopathy that are that the world simply needs to recognize because it is it hasn't changed in more than 200 years. We need it to know, and, and this is something Isaac Golden points out uh, with the COVID-19, what presents in India is not necessarily what's going to present in the mountains of the Rocky Mountains of the United States or you know the deserts of, us, uh, of, of the Sahara or any place. We need to know what that, that the genus epidemicus remedy for this region is going to be different from there. It's just we need to look at everything. There's not one magic answer. These are all fundamental homeopathic principles. So let's look at homeoprophylaxis, its roots. I love to um, 
speak about this because when I was first beginning to delve into homeoprophylaxis, there were many homeopaths who were telling me that it's not homeopathic. It's not homeopathic. You know, it's just, it's just a reaction. We want to, the, the homeopaths who want to make money by, find, by following what conventional medicine is doing with vaccines. No, 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 no. It's a lot more deep than that. Okay, it's deeply embedded within homeopathy. In the lesser writings of Samuel Hahnemann, uh, he has a, a work in there I would very much encourage you to read called simply The Cure and Prevention of Scarlet Fever. This is, uh, Hahnemann wrote this in 1801 regarding events that happened in 1799. So interesting that this happened in 1796 was when Edward Jenner uh, became known, started becoming known for his work with uh, smallpox and cowpox. This happened in a, at that time, it was a small village of Königslutter in Germany. Um, he was asked to go there because there was an outbreak of the devastating scourge of scarlet fever. That's what Hahnemann calls it, a devastating scourge. And he describes it very much in a lot of detail, what he was, excuse me, observing about this fever. And so he saw it all over the place there. He explains what he understood about contagious disease. He, he talks about a woman, a washerwoman, who had, had a certain article of clothing that happened to, it seemed, brought the disease over to her son, um, and it spread from there. Very, very interesting to see that he was observing all this. He also noticed that the symptoms the scarlet fever were producing happened to be very similar to homeopathically prepared belladonna. So he began treating people there with the, with the scarlet fever with belladonna, seeing very, very good results. Now, there was a young fa uh, family there where the eldest daughter had already been taking belladonna for, he just called it an external affliction on the joints of her fingers. The details about this he does not get into, he doesn't need to, but he noted that she was always one of the first to take on an illness or an epidemic in the whole village. But interestingly, she was not affected at all, at all by the scarlet fever, but three of her siblings had been. Scientist that he was, Hahnemann said, well, I wonder if there was probably a connection with this. And so what he did was he gave Belladonna to the other five children in her family, in, in, in this family. So that's a total of three, four, of about nine children in this family. In very small doses, he gave them. And you know what? They all remained perfectly well without the slightest symptoms throughout the whole course of the epidemic and amid the most virulent scarlatina emanations from their sisters who lay ill with the disease. He was very, very impressed. He reasoned thus, a remedy that is capable of quickly checking a disease in its onset must, onset must be its best preventive. Hahnemann himself is saying this. He treated the whole village of Königsluta, stopped the epidemic there. Very, very interesting. <clears throat> he shares a few, more, uh, a few more words here. One of my chief aims talking specifically about scarlet fever here, but knowing the great uh, scientist that Hahnemann was, I know that he was looking beyond this. One of my chief aims, he says, is to excite a great interest in a subject of so much importance to humanity as this is. He said further, who can deny that the perfect prevention of infection would offer infinite advantage, advantages over any mode of treatment be it of the most incomparable kind soever. Prevention is better than cure, is what he's saying there, basically. So he ended up becoming quite known with this. Benninghausen, Herring, a couple of his, of his followers, explored uh, further into this, too. Uh, Aphorism 33 uh, in, in, in his organon. He makes further mention of this, saying, if medicines can protect us from the contagion of a raging epidemic, they must possess a greater power to affect our vital force, to alter our vital force, than the epidemic. Again, Hahnemann's own words testifying of this. He also clearly followed what he shares uh, further in the Organon. He knew that Belladonna would likely not have the same effect in subsequent outbreaks or uh, epidemics of scarlet fever in his lesser writings. Um, 
there's there's observations on scarlet fever this is where he quotes this he emphasizes that the individual and the unique case must be taken into consideration every time we really do need to be cautious about this today uh still with homeo homeoprophylaxis the success however of belladonna at preventing scarlet fever helped hahnemann and homeopathy to gain renown this is what again uh dr manchanda emphasized it's it's homeoprophylaxis that helped homeopathy gained renown. It was 1838 that the Prussian government itself called for the use of belladonna, probably with the encouragement of uh, King Friedrich Wilhelm III. And interesting to note here too that uh, a bit of the story that's not often spoken about, uh, King Friedrich actually had a son who nearly died because of the smallpox vaccine. And at that time, it was it was uh, the thing to do if you're uh, the elite, if you're in the upper class, you you can do these wonderful things called vaccinations because they're for the the upper class, they're for the better people. But again, he nearly lost his son to this vaccine. You can imagine the joy that uh, King Friedrich felt when he learned of this non toxic. Uh, option. In 1843, I have a copy of this British Journal of Homeopathy, their very first uh, very first volume. They have a full article on the preservative properties of belladonna in scarlet fever, written by uh, homeopath and medical doctor Francis Black of Edinburgh. He compiled uh, the works of some 19 homeopathic physicians who uh, tried belladonna with scarlet fever. Every one of them had tremendous success. And it's very interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, to read this article because he gets into detail about uh, the different dosings that they used, uh, how they went by age, how they prepared um, this. Several of them actually consulted directly with Hahnemann himself. It was early enough in the time, of course, that they were able to do so. Uh, it, it, this whole article was very widely quoted and referenced, and I even have a copy of this book here, The Logic of Figures, by Dr. Thomas, uh, excuse me, Dr. William Bradford, that he published in 1900. Uh, what he wanted to do, he was a homeopath here in the United States, uh, and he wanted to do a comparative compilation of uh, allopathic and homeopathic hospitals. So he went throughout the United States, he went uh, through Europe, he went even over to Russia just to compile the the, the 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 two different schools there and and this whole work I will very much encourage you to find a copy of this too it's available in an e form um, to look through this and find what is shared there because the numbers there you cannot intelligently argue with how how good they are here's just a page from it uh, page number thirty one where he he lists and this is actually a quote from uh, copied from Dr Black's article from the British Journal of Homeopathy. And you can see, again, these are just some of the numbers, every one of them having great success with homeoprophylaxis. So Hahnemann himself, he continued research into uh, the prophylactic use of homeopathic medicines. Uh, in his lesser writings, he's got a work uh, in there called The Cause and Prevention of the Asiatic Cholera. This is where they 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 determined, he was working with Brenninghausen with this one, uh, how well uh, Kuprum, Kopp worked for this. There are many, many other works, uh, many other homeopaths co who have commented favorably about this. And I, I'm only going to quote a couple of them here. Uh, but you can, one of uh, Dr. Golden's works, Vaccination and Homeoprophylaxis, it's a re review of risks and alternative. He's got pages of quotes of homeopaths from around the world, uh, from throughout history, throughout Hahnemann's time, who are talking about the prophylactic use of homeopathic medicines. Uh, but let me share with you just a couple of uh, quotes from homeopaths that you may have heard of. This is James Tyler Kent. He said, we must look to homeopathy for our protection as well as our cure. And these remedies will enable you to prevent a large number of people from becoming sick. And Dr. Arthur Grimmer, in 1949, he said this too, as the law of similars excels in the power to cure, it excels more forcibly and certainly in the art of disease prevention. A further quote from him, too, it is strange so little has been said by homeopathic doctors familiar with the widespread possibilities of homeopathic prophylaxis, especially in the face of the so many harmful and even deadly accidents that have followed the application of the prevailing methods 
of protection against acute epidemic diseases. Why is it not being talked about? The, the, the evening before I and my husband left Delhi, uh, left India, when we came back home, we were able to have dinner with Dr. Manchanda and his beautiful wife. Uh, and she shared how homeoprophylaxis has simply, it's been a part of her practice for years since she started. It's just something that is accepted. It's something that is done. We need to have this uh, as commonplace for us as, as it has been spoken about, as it, is, as it has been hoped for by homeopaths for years. So let's look at homeoprophylaxis and homeopathy in epidemics and pandemics. Again, Dr. Manchana, homeopathy is known today because of how well it works prophylactically and in epidemics and pandemics. Let's look closer at this. Here's just a few numbers, uh, a few uh, epidemics that I've collected here just to present to you too. So you can look at that. The very first one, of course, is the, the scarlet fever one that uh, Hahnemann was in the middle of one. Uh, uh, and you can see the treatment, the uh, homeopathic treatment, the allopathic treatment. One of these that I thought I would point out to you, the 1854 one for, done in London for a cholera epidemic. This was a very interesting one of note because this was the first epidemic that they were able to trace the outbreak to a single source, it was a public water pump. This epidemic also reduced in numbers very, very quickly once they closed that pump down. Well, the House of Lords, as the numbers went down, wanted a, uh, an explanation for, from, from the medical community as to uh, what they were seeing. And, and so they, they were surprised when they were presented these numbers, let me just read you something that uh, Julian Winston uh, shared about this. When the report was issued to the House of Commons, the, ho the homeopathic figures were not included. The House of Lords asked for an explanation, and it was admitted that if the homeopathic figures were to be included in this report, it would skew the numbers. So the suppressed report uh, that was demanded revealed that under allopathic care, the mortality rate, as, as you can see, was 59.2%, whereas under homeopathic care, it was only 9%. This is how good it was. This is how good, when you look at it, at the bottom there, this is uh, just one of the uh, numbers from the United States regarding the Spanish flu. Okay, 1.05% compared to 30% or more. This is just something that we need to grasp hold of because uh, as the, 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 the article that I referenced above, I'm working to get to actual scientific sources supporting that article that's happened, that happened in Western India. These numbers are still happening today. Uh, Kathy, if I might just um, interrupt. Can you hide yes. that bar right at the bottom? Uh, there's a small uh, sign saying hide, because that, uh, no. Uh, oh, right here. It? Yes, yes, if you could just okay. hide that. Okay, hide. Okay. Yes, that's, that's right. Okay, maybe All go right. back here. There we go. So, okay, yeah. I didn't uh, know if that was only on my screen. <laughs> Sometimes they're on, on my screen, but no one else's, but I thank you for saying that. That's thank right. you for saying yeah. that. So there, there's the numbers, a mortality of 1.05% for the Spanish flu. So let's look at a small historical sampling of a collection of studies done on homeoprophylaxis. This is courtesy of Dr. Gold, and he allowed me to share these. This is when you look at and consider the numbers. Let's just study these. Okay, this, these are just a few of these. These numbers really stand for themselves. Uh, homeoprophylactic studies for scarlet fever, for cholera, for diphtheria, for polio, for influenza starting from 1798. Technically speaking, homeoprophylaxis is a lot more thoroughly studied than vaccination. Here's another uh, page from 1967 to 1999. I, it was, uh, yeah, Dr. Srini Vasulu uh, actually came. He was one of our speakers in Delhi uh, with his Japanese encephalitis. Uh, it's um, the amazing. There's 20, uh, wasn't it actually 23 million cases down to zero within three years? with homeoprophylaxis. And then we get up to more, more recently, we, we cover the wonderful leptospirosis study that was done 
in Cuba by the Finlay Institute. Very, very dramatic. I'm going to talk about, uh, as you saw, let's see, in this one about, um, yeah, meningitis, this is the Moninsky study, meningitis that was done in Brazil. That I'll, I'll share just a few more numbers about that, a few more details that I just, um, I love to share this because it's so good. Here's some numbers about the wonderful leptospirosis study uh, done in 2007, 2008. This was uh, the problem happening in Cuba, and Gu Dr. Gustavo Brasho uh, from Cuba, he was one of our speakers in Delhi as well. Um, he was one of the key, he worked for the Finlay Institute. They were having a real struggle in Cuba because every year the leptospirosis comes, it's endemic to Cuba, it comes as a res uh, right along with hurricane season. And they chose to do uh, the provinces of Las Tunas, Holguin, and Granma in the southeastern part of, of, of Cuba because those are the three states of Cuba that were hardest hit, have been hardest hit by leptospirosis. You can see not only did their, the vaccines were not working. So they said, we've got to do something different. So they tried a homeoprophylactic approach in 2007. You can see not only did the numbers drop, but they actually stayed down. And it's so interesting, too, that they did this, and then they were having such success with it, but right around 83 84% success, that they figured, well, you know what, maybe we ought to tell Isaac Golden about this. And so they brought him over, and he looked at it, and he assessed things, and he helped put things together. And he uh, loves to point this out. Vaccines were costing them millions, but homeoprophylaxis cost them, he, he points out, this is 1 20th of the cost of vaccines to do things homeoprophylactically. It's something that is so necessary to know worldwide. And here we go into a little bit more about this, these two Brazilian studies. In 1974, this was a privately done study involving 18,600 uh, who were protected with HP against uh, meningitis. Saw only four cases, but 6,300 not protected. Saw 32 cases. This had a rate of effectiveness of right around 86%. Well, the Brazilian government learned of this. 1998, they said the government funded this study in 1998. They said, we're not, we're not just going to do it. We're going to have a 12-month follow-up after this, too. So here's what they did. 65,826 were protected with AHP, seeing, again, only four cases of meningitis. 23,500 not protected, saw 20 cases. Uh, based on this rate of attack, 58 cases of infection would have been ex in, expected in the HP treated group. But again, it was there was only four. So it, the rate of effectiveness for this was 95% within six months and still 91.5 in 12 months. Very dramatic, very effective, solid, uh, information that we need to know. We're in a very unique place today. We within homeopathy, we recognize the value, the need for disease, but this label, disease, is an allopathic label. Hahnemann pointed this out hundreds of years ago. You read about it throughout the organon. The predominant thought governing conventional medicine today, as described earlier, is this rationalist materials approach. Much good, as I've emphasized, has happened and is being done today because of this. However, many not so good things are happening as well because Hippocratic principles are being ignored, are being shunned. Holistic principles are being belittled. I don't know how bad it is in India. I don't think it is as bad as it is over here in the United States. But it's something that needs to be recognized as happening because it needs to be changed. The prevailing thought, something must be defined to its smallest point before something can be done. We look at the research, the continuing research, and we look at the fact that the article that I shared, because of the success happening in Western India, it's pulled because Facebook even gave me the threat, <laughs> gave me the, the, the statement, excuse me, let me say it fairly, it gave me the statement that this goes against our standards uh, because something that is, uh, uh, they didn't say not proven. They said, um, well, basically, something that is not known to cause help, to, to help, may cause fear. Well, you know what? This article spoke very, very clearly that it does help, that it is helping. 
it does not we need to be defined to its smallest point. We need to recognize that things are done that are working. Okay, beyond this allopathic medicine. And this is why I need to watch things pretty closely, why I'm very glad to be working with attorney Jim Turner. Tells us within homeopathy, we have a cure. We cannot say this. We have a cure for an allopathically labeled condition or disease. We cannot say we are able to treat an allopathically labeled or condition condition or disease. We cannot say that we are able, can prevent an allopathically labeled condition or disease. So let me build on that for us all here. Homeopathic medicines have been successfully doing exactly this for symptoms that these allopathically labeled diseases have been presenting and has been doing so for more than 200 years. We need to approach homeopathy today with great confidence because of its effective history. We need to love what we have within homeopathy. Some ideas to hold fast to, homeoprophylaxis is designed to build, strengthen the vital force and therewith educate the immune system. I love that phrase. I said golden coin, that phrase. We're working, with, we're working with the body. That's what homeopathy, that's what we all know. Homeopathy works with the body. To do what? To educate the immune system, to strengthen the individual, to learn what it needs to do. To avoid as possible diseases that can permanently damage, such as polio, such as smallpox, and that, some, that can kill. Uh, meningitis, when it's contracted, can kill within 24 hours. But you saw just a couple slides ago how effective homeoprophylaxis can be. This, coincidentally, we also need to recognize the conventional approach, which is a fear-based approach. We need to avoid disease. Disease is dangerous. Well, we know so much more within homeopathy. Remember again, though, that no form of prevention will ever be 100% effective. My husband will point out, except for death, but you know what? Who wants to go there? No form of prevention will ever be 100% effective. Homeoprophylaxis holds a consistent track record of being about 90% effective, which is comparable to any vaccine. Homeoprophylaxis is homeopathic, as you've seen. It follows the law of similars. As you've seen, Hahnemann recognizes like cures like, it also prevents like. We follow the minimum dose with homeoprophylaxis. Again, its effectiveness is right about 90%. We need to work with the conventional or the rationalist, rational materialistic medicine because that's the predominant medicine today. Some homeopaths, unfortunately, are trying to completely copy what conventional medicine presents for immunization. Let me emphasize right here the word immunization. In too many schools, common schools today, they use the words immunization and vaccination as if they were the same word. They're not. Vaccination is a form of immunization, so is homeoprophylaxis. That's why we do not say it's homeopathic vaccination. No, guess what it is? It's homeopathic immunization. So what we have, uh, unfortunately today, are there are homeopaths who are trying to mimic, mock, copy what conventional medicine is doing and put it in uh, homeopathy. That's where homeop homeopathy can get a bad name, even from within homeopath homeop from homeopaths. <laughs> and so what we need to do is what we are working with, and I do this every day. I've got, I'm meeting with someone tomorrow and I met with someone yesterday. I've got, I, I meet with people all the time because so many parents feel the need to have their children immunized, but they want to have it done safely. And so that's what I put together homeoprophylaxis, a worldwide choice for. I don't know how many more international conferences I'm going to be able to do, but the focus really needs to be on the local level, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in India, whether you're in Germany, wherever you are, it needs to be built up on the local level. So that's what we are doing uh, with, because we don't want to copy what conventional medicine is doing. It's not building of the whole person. It's not building of these God-given bodies that we have, these God-given immune systems. They're forgetting Hahnemann's, those who are doing homeoprophylaxis simply to earn money. They're forgetting Hahnemann's call to strengthen the vital force, to educate the immune system, to honor the divinely created body and its God-given symptoms. It wants to be well. Let's work with that. We'll build on wellness, 
wellness according to the body's innate desire to be well. Now, briefly, too, too there are four primary approaches for homeoprophylaxis. I'll just briefly go into those. One is the individualization method where, where as Hahnemann talks about throughout his uh, organ, the gold standard, you've got to find out what's happening here, what's happening there, what's happening with Johnny, what's happening with Janie. This is very good. This is very effective. But when we're talking about epidemics, things like that, it's not as effective. It, 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 there are other ways it can be done. There's combination remedies. This, I prefer primarily to do homeoprophylaxis individually because when you talk about combination vaccines, then comes in the warning sign that uh, we have the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella. While they've been tested individually, they've never been tested combined. So uh, that being said, when we're talking about a homeopathic approach for immunization, uh, there are those who will combine remedies and, and have tremendous results. Let me emphasize that's how, what was done in uh, India. For the, for the Japanese uh, encephalitis study. That was a combination remedy, tremendously effective. Uh, what was done in Cuba for leptospirosis? That was another combination rem remedy, tremendously effective. I, uh, again, I live on a small farm. We use homeopathy for our animals all the time. I, uh, so I work with uh, homeopathic vets. I know a homeopathic vet in the UK. He does homeoprophylaxis for animals all the time combination. That's what we've started doing with our animals as well, too. So they can have its effect, but it can also um, have its drawbacks as well. The genus epidemicus, they've talked about that earlier. The genus epidemicus can be incredibly effective, but it can be effective only in a certain area, not necessarily worldwide, like with the current coronavirus. Uh, what is showing the greatest promise right now is, is this fourth approach, the is isopathy, nozodes, remedies, and we'll talk about this too. Find a unique thing. One of the, um, and I'll share with you here, uh, I, I'm frequently asked by professionals, that's one of the people that I'm talking with tomorrow, for what, they, what can they use because a lot of people want to have a non-toxic way to prevent this coronavirus. I talk with them, I, I tell them first and foremost, you've got to get them past the fear. you got to help them understand that it's not as dangerous as everything through the media is leading them to believe, okay? And you've got to build on this individually, but because individually as far as is, 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 is Johnny or Janie uh, sick generally, well, then you've got to be more cautious. Of course, you've got to be more cautious. There's no question there. But is Johnny or Janie generally healthy? Well, they're healthy, except that they're so scared. Well, this is where the remedy um, arsenic amalgam really comes in as far as it helps so much with the bronchial, with the respiratory issues, but it also helps with fear, the same kind of fear that's being promulgated today so far. So that's what I, I have been sharing uh, primarily with, with those, the practitioners especially, who are looking for something uh, to help with their patients as far as a prophylactic against this, because fear opens the door to susceptibility to so many things. And when you can close that door to fear, you can get on with things. So in any case, this uh, fourth approach holds a lot of promise because, again, it, it, it in ways can be quite similar to the conventional approach for immunization today. So there, there's the four primary approaches. Here I'll share this with you too. These are just a few of remedies, uh, nozodes, that can be utilized, that are being utilized for homeoprophylaxis. Uh, let me point out with these two uh, a couple of interesting things. The For malaria, since Hahnemann's time, Natmur has been showing to be very effective. The malaria nozode is widely used today too, but this is something that I, I conversed with um, Isaac Golden about this. He says, yes, the malaria nozode is one that can be very effective, but, for an over, but only for certain strains. Okay, the Natmur is, is one of the, uh, is the time-tested one that is, has been proven to be very, very effective. Again, uh, as far as the polio, Lathyrus sativus, the polio nozode, it's the same story there. The polio nozode can be very effective, but Lathyrus sativus, that remedy 
has been shown in every study that I've seen, and, and Dorothy Shepard in her one work, she talks about this as well, in every uh, test that has been done with Lathyrus sativus for polio prevention, it's been shown again and again to be right around 100% effective. So that's just good to know, to, to, to refer to. Uh, knowing history, just in closing, helps us actually learn from it and improve where we are today so that humanity is there with improved. That's what we need to do with homeopathy. We need to approach it with confidence. We need to speak out with confidence because what we have is powerful, gentle, and highly effective. Hardly anything is actually proven. Almost everything is simply assumptions. The biggest error in every field of science is the fact that so-called knowledge is nothing more than a current theory or model of thought. So here are just a few references I will leave uh, for you. You can do a screenshot of this or whatever so that you can reference these as well. There's this and so much more uh, that is out there for you, uh, <clears throat> for your use of homeoprophylaxis. Here's my contact information. Uh, the website for homeoprophylaxis is a worldwide choice. I am working to get uh, together uh, practitioner training for homeoprophylaxis. In the meantime, Isaac Golden does have an online training for this that is tremendously good. That's my practice right there. Uh, we have a website up, homeoprophylaxis.education, where it has actual recordings of the inaugural 2015 conference, um, which you might be very, very interested in. And let me point out here, too, I haven't yet said this. HPWWC, homeoprophylaxis.org, my organization is actually a nonprofit. All the proceeds from anything that's sold on HPWWC.org and homeoprophylaxis.education goes to support homeoprophylaxis because it goes to support HPWWC.org. So that is my presentation for you. I thank you for your attention uh, for this. I hope it has helped. Uh, of course, I hope Kathy. it's helped. Thank you. Yes, yes, of course. There's so much of information that you've shared with us, so much of history that uh, we have kind of forgotten, I think, uh, on on the work homeopathy has been doing over the last 200 years. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, something we need to really look at. We need to make it widely accepted, widely known, first of all, so people can actually look at it in in a different light. Uh, we yes. have, yes, yes. Uh, there are a few people who, who are starting to ask. Uh, let me just switch. I'm trying to. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on. Stop the screen share. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I've just done that. Uh, there's uh, Robin Pollock who would like to uh, ask if she, you can share the reference page. Uh, you know what? What I can do, because yeah, I've stopped it, the screen share. I, mm -hmm. I, I I will share with you a copy of 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 the, of the um, PowerPoint. Yeah. Yes, yes. Because I I want that information in people's hands. So yes, definitely. I will yes, definitely share yeah. that. So I will I will see to it that everybody gets a a copy of that. So whoever's attended. Absolutely. Uh, who, Absolutely. Whoever's interested, because uh, we should be looking at taking this to every homeopath. Uh, we have to make him understand that homeopathy has got more than what it has uh, or what they know of it now. Is the homeopathic profile axis do antibody count change? Uh, he's that's a about very good question. Yes, that, yeah. that's a very, very good question. And uh, In short, homeoprophylaxis <clears throat> should not be done for the sake of, of building antibodies. One of the speakers at our 2015 conference was an immunologist. I'm not an immunologist, but her name is uh, Tatiana Obukanich. Uh, and and she is, uh, she's one who point, points out that antibody production is one of the last things that a body does in response to a disease. Uh, and what homeoprophylaxis does is it builds immunity. It does not necessarily build antibodies. And and this is another thing that I didn't point out during this presentation, uh, that 
the the leptose process study that was done in Cuba was so successful that one of the things that Dr. Gustavo Brasho decided he needed to do was look into it further. So we actually did a, a study uh, with mice. And the first group of mice he exposed directly to leptose process virus, every one of them died. The second group of mice he treated with them with homeoprophylaxis before exposing them to the leptose process virus. 80% of them survived. Not one of them produced any antibodies. So while there are some anecdotal studies that have been done, I believe one, one was done in Colombia that showed that uh, antibodies were produced after um, homeoprophylaxis, those, there aren't that many studies. However, comma, there are enough studies compiled and collected through the years that are testifying that HP is successful right about 90% of the time. That's what we need to focus on. Unfortunately, we are in, it, this is part of the, the rational school that we're in that, that says you're not immune. It, a, a vaccine is considered effective if it causes the body to produce antibodies, even though they know that antibody pre, pres, the presence of antibodies does not necessarily indicate immunity. But uh, because we're in the school of thought where, where, where we have the thought presented so loudly and so forcefully that you, you, you've got to have a titer count check. You've got to have an antibody check. We've got to work with this. And this is another reason we've got to speak out so much more loudly within homeopathy because homeoprophylaxis immunity is there right 90% of the time when HP is used. That is what should be recognized. That is what needs to be recognized, whether or not antibodies are there. Oh, the COVID-19 no so <laughs> Okay. Uh, as far as the COVID-19 no so I, unfortunately, there is a, there is a um, homeopathic pharmacy here in the United States that produced, presented a, a, a COVID-19 no so almost as soon as it was announced. I don't use that. I don't support it because I feel that as being, uh, I, I look at the work Isaac Golden is doing. I, I look, look at the work uh, Gustavo Brasho is doing. I look at the work being done by so many Indian homeopaths as far as um, this COVID-19. What I'm finding works, and you'll find this too with, with, with uh, and that's another page you can share as well too, the page at the beginning, the different resources, homeopathic resources for education about the COVID-19. Um, remedies that are working, already working and have been working against every symptom the COVID-19 uh, virus produces for more than 200 years are already there in homeopathy. Arsenic amalgam, gelsemium, Bryonia, uh, cuprum. There are many, many remedies that are that are showing to be effective, and this is this is one of the things with the COVID nineteen, uh, the this coronavirus. It is very adaptable. It is very changeable. This is why it is so different in place X as a, uh, compared to place Y. This is why you have to take care of and this. This gets back to the four different types of uh, HP that are being used. You've got to find what's going to be the genus epidemicus for location X. The genus epidemic is for location Y. Arsenicum album can be used as a preventative because, uh, because of how well it works with the fear. And that's why I'm finding it works very well here in the United States because of how much fear is being promulgated about it. But right now, it's just, I don't know that there will be a need for a coronavirus 19, a COVID-19 nozode. We just need to be versed in homeopathy, in the research that has already been done, and in the remedies that have been working against these symptoms. Uh, that's another question from Janacina. Okay. You mean that because homeopathy has not changed its principles for centuries, that gives it validity. This can be argued exactly the opposite way. Okay, I appreciate the comment, Jan. Uh, however, there are, there are things, th this is when, uh, uh, as I approach this, and please do correct me if, if you find that I'm wrong in, in what you're trying to say here. 
Hahnemann based his principles as anciently as Hippocrates. And even Hippocrates is said to have based his principles on even deeper, more old Asian thoughts. Uh, no, homie, uh, Hahnemann was not a, a scientist. Uh, he was a scientist. He was not a medical physician. He's not going to cut people open, you know, things like that. Uh, but therewith, I will always, I'll also present that today... We have a lot of things, like I like I tried presenting through through uh, the presentation as well. That there are um, wonderful things happening today because of modern science, because of the rationalist school. However, th it's also been been found that. Um, let me let me get my thoughts together for this. It's also been found that because principles have the, the Hahnemannian principles, let me say it this way. If Hahnemann were alive today, I would present that he would probably be working on about his 30th edition of the Organon because things are changing. Things are still changing. However, some things don't need to change. Why was Hahnemann espousing eating well? Why was he espousing cleanliness? Why was he ex espousing exercise? Things that we uh, recognize today as being essential to good health. Uh, homeopathic principles, the foundational principles, are not going to change. Like will still cure like. This is why homeopathic remedies are still working on our animals. That's why they're still working in our garden. That's why they still work with infants. Things like that will not change. So I would like to, um, dis I, I, I'd be happy to, to discuss this further, but I think that will probably take a lot, a lot more time than we probably really have at this, at this point in time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, does anybody else have anything to ask, uh, Kathy? Yes. Oh, it's... So uh, no, I think everybody's uh, kind of done done with their questions. All right. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just go back to the presentation. Oh, sorry, that was still on. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was still yeah, showing. I guess you still have that, huh? Okay. Okay. Let me let me put that last page up for everybody, please, so they can. Uh, see the reference material at least, uh, and also one of the first pages too that that I have the picture of the coronavirus on that. There's a lot of references one? on that one yeah. as well. Oh, okay, this is the references uh, of all the books you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that um, homeopathy has got so much to offer, and we still look for an also. Uh, And as you said, in one location, you can have a totally different remedy. And maybe next door, you can have a totally different remedy as well. Yeah. Right. So, but I think overall in India, I think we're seeing more of arsenic amalgam, which uh, again is because of the fear uh, factor, like you were saying. Uh, mm -hmm. There's so many other... It was actually... Uh, Please. It was actually Dr. Anil Karana who who first pointed out the Arsenicum album and and the fear That's factor. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So, I think in the U.S. we've we've been hearing um, notes on uh, Nuxwamica in the Florida mm -hmm. area and uh, Gelsemium, yes. I think, in the in the Northeast. Uh, so we've we've been hearing different stories from that side. Right, right. Yeah. Is that another question there? Where? No, no. No. Okay. That that, that was just the same question. Okay. <laughs> okay, the same one. Okay. Now also there there's the the one that I shared at the beginning. Mm, no. With the coronavirus picture. Okay, let me get to that one. Uh, 
earlier than that. All oh, right. Okay. That one, one. That one. Yes. Yes. Okay. As far as simply okay. learning directly about the coronavirus, and especially the, mm-hmm. well, especially all of them. <laughs> there, there's true. a lot of good. A lot of good information that I would encourage everybody to become well versed in. Yeah, I'll share this with everybody uh, and also Perfect. have it up on the website and the page. Uh, so whoever wants to get their hands on this can download it. Very I good. Did submit Very another good. question. Oh, yes, yes, Jan, if you have another question, please do submit it. Uh, Jan uh, wanted to ask another question. Okay. Yeah. I did submit another question. Okay, let me see. Uh, let me uh, think I may have missed it. Ah, 90% success of HP. Okay, you claim 90% success for HP. Please would you give details of where you can get this figure from? That, okay, and that's a very good question. If you go to Isaac Golden's website, he is one place that will that has a lot of, of this information right directly on this. Uh, his his website is H O M and I don't you know what? That might not have even been on there. Okay. Uh, that's a very good question to ask. Home study. So it's H O M study for homeopathic. H O M study dot com. And then he's got a website, uh, excuse me, a page on his website for for research. And that's where he's got a lot of this uh, right there. And what he doesn't have there, he will have reference to it uh, so that you can find it. Because, yeah, this is not information that we want to keep under our hats. This is information that we want loudly shared. Right. Is it this one? Am I right with that? It's. I believe uh, so. I believe so. Homestudy.com. No, no, just just one word. Just one word. Just one word, word. is it? Okay. Home yeah, let, let me pull it up myself just to just to make certain. Oops. Right here. Oops. Yes, home I'm sorry, it's homestudy.net. Dot, dot is net. what it is. is. It? Okay. Homestudy.net. Okay. Uh, we have another uh, from Lusty. So when to use no food and when remedy, as you said, is more effective. Basically, that is, a, you, you know what? Control? Yeah, that is a question that I. It's it's a personal professional choice because they're, they're both going to be effective. I work with a couple of homeopaths, husband and wife homeopath team in Germany named uh, Ravi and Carola. I love them. Ravi Roy and Carola Lagerroy. They only use no zodes in their homeop- homeoprophylactic pro- uh, practice. And they've been doing homeoprophylaxis longer than Isaac Golden has. They've got, uh, they, yeah, look up, look up lagerroy.de for their, uh, for their website. It's primarily in German, but at the same time, they, they've got their own publishing company. But at the same time, as far as nozodes and, and remedies, uh, what to use, what is most effective, Ravi and Krola like to use only nosodes. I look at studies behind the Lathyrus sativus, how well that is. I look behind Nat Mur and malaria. That's highly effective. That would really be a professional choice for you to make. Because you've got a high rate of, of efficacy with both. Right. I think uh, there's another question. Uh, Bob yeah, that was homestudy.net. So that everyone could Yes, yes. Yeah, I think uh, that's about it. And then he's got a tab there, there on natural. Okay, I- Isaac has a, t- a tab there on natural immunization research. That's where it all is, right from that site. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think with this we'll uh, end end this webinar. It was an, All right. it was an amazing webinar. So my uh, storehouse of knowledge, I must say, <laughs> storehouse oh, of history uh, first, <laughs> and then the knowledge would come. But there is so much to share, and there is so much to learn from, uh, which I think you're going, you're uh, working on. 
if if there's anything we can do, if there's anything I can help you with, uh, all you have to do is ask, and we'll be there. Well, the same same for you, please. Absolutely. Right. Thank you thank so you, much for this you. opportunity. Thank you, Kathy, and mm -hmm. I'd like to thank each and every of the attendee who who was here and. We have so much of information. I think it's going to take us a couple of days for us to just absorb this, read about it, and uh, maybe they'll email you with uh, more doubts they have on this subject. Please, I'll happily, happily answer as I can. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, and, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. Do I just click off now? Yes, you yeah. could just click off. Uh, okay. Have a good day. All right, then. Thank you so much. All right, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everybody.